getting close to holiday season. Some of you may remember in years past we produced Millbrook Historical Society ornaments. We don't have any new ones, but if you did not get uh, previous year's editions of these ornaments, there's one that has the library on it, there's one that has the thorn building on it. We have a few over here for sale. Um, if you didn't bring any money, you can email the Historical Society or give me a call or anything and I can deliver them to you, whatever. Um, but take a look at them afterward if you're, if you're interested. Um, second thing to mention, um, Allison wants me to pass around this uh, email list. I know many of you are probably on our email list already, but if you're not, you can put your name down to get reminders about events and programs. Appreciate so if we're it. not on it, if you are not on it, you should sign up. If you're already on it, there's no need to sign up again. Uh, third thing. We are in the midst of figuring out what programs to have for 2023. We do not have that finalized yet, but I can reveal publicly for the first time our January program, which is lockdown. Um, there's a guy named Mark Dillon, who is a New York State Supreme Court judge, who a couple months ago published a book about John Jay, the founding father John Jay. And so he's going to come and give a talk uh, about that book in January um, here at the library. Um, he's going to focus in particular on Jay's connections to Dutchess County, kind of early in his career when, when he was a lawyer. So something to look forward to there. And hopefully before we get to Christmas, people will get the list of all of our schedule for 2023. So you can, you can plan ahead. Um, the formal bit of business we got to take care of, uh, our November meeting is always our, our like official business meeting where we have to nominate and vote on um, new trustees, new board members, officers for the Historical Society. Um, so this is a little bit pro forma, but this is just something we have to take care of. If you guys are members, we ask you to vote in a second. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who's just going to explain who's up for election here. Thank you. So um, this year we have two officer positions that are open. Um, for Vice President John Flanagan has agreed to serve another two-year term, and for Treasurer Jim Inglis also has agreed to serve another two-year term. For our trustees, we have three positions open. We um, are um, pleased that Kevin McCrane and Michael Sahalis have both agreed to serve another three-year term, and we welcome new trustee Denise Bauer, who is here with us tonight, um, as a new trustee, also serving for a three-year term. So perhaps we can have a vote on Yes, so if you are a member of, of the Historical Society, and by the way, is everyone a member? No. You guys should be members. If you're not, all right. <laughs> but if you're a member, you can vote. And I'll just ask people, if you approve those five names to say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you for voting. Thank you. Democracy in action. Uh, <laughs> this list, is this for non-members or? That is for anyone who wants to get emails about what we're doing. Beyond, beyond the club, beyond the historical society. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's emails about historical society events, but like anyone can sign up for emails. Okay, now I'm already a member, so it seems like it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense to sign up. You get the mailing already, so yeah, yeah, if you yeah. don't need the emails, that's fine. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen here. Kristen is the Director of Adult Events. That's, that's very library. close. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator. Okay. <laughs> adult Programs <laughs> <Adult. laughs> <laughs> 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 um, But she's going to talk about Bennett College through uh, its archives. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so, so much for coming. Um, I'm one of those people who, who very much writes the whole thing down, including like jokes and pauses, and then reads it to you, and, and does not speak terribly well extemporaneously. So bear with me, I have it all written down here. Um, and then it'll be about a 45 minute presentation, just so you know, I, I hope I cut a bunch just now. And then there'll be time at the end for questions, but also comments. I know some of you remember Bennett College. and. Um, have anecdotes yourself to share. So, uh, I wanted to start by thanking you all for coming. I'm a transplant to Millbrook from California, but 
Living in Millbrook and especially working here at the library, I feel connected to this village and this community and I'm really gratified to be given the opportunity to explore a vital part of Millbrook's history and to share some of my findings with you. I know what has been a research project and fascination of mine is, for some of you, a part of your life or the lives of your siblings, mothers, and friends. There will be time at the end of the presentation, and I've said this, for questions and comments. All right, so this is a history of Bennett College as told through the artifacts and the extensive Bennett collection which is housed here at the Millbrook Library. We are walking through a curated museum of objects together tonight. Rather than focus on one person, one period, or even exactly one institution, we'll be focusing on a few key artifacts in the collection, approximately one for each decade the school was in existence. Looking at specific artifacts helps reveal the contours of lives lived by individual students or faculty members who wore a sweater, read from a Bible, or lovingly glued a photo into a scrapbook. While I'll certainly also review the broad legacy of Bennett College, this is meant to be a past revealed in miniature that recognizes that history is made up of ordinary people's ordinary moments. So, we can start at the very beginning, Bennett College, at times called Bennett School, Miss Bennett School for Girls and Boys, and Bennett Junior College was a school founded in 1890 in Irvington on the Hudson and moved to Millbrook in 1809, where it ran until bankruptcy and closure in 1978. In 1985, the Bennett College Foundation and the Bennett Alumni Committee transferred a considerable archive of primarily print material to the Millbrook Library, then the Hayes Memorial Library. Smaller private donations have been added in the intervening years, and the Millbrook Library collection represents the largest holding of Bennett College archival material. The archive itself lives downstairs, almost directly beneath my feet. If you've come to an event at the library in the past, you may be familiar with the Bennett Room, our community room downstairs where we host movie nights and book cl clubs and <coughs> art classes. The room is officially the Bennett College community room generously funded by the Bennett College Foundation and dedicated in July 27, 2001. And here you can see our commemorative plaque saying as much. In a closet in the northwest corner of the Bennett room, we have the Bennett Archive. 60 boxes of various sizes and organized with various degrees of fastidiousness. Um, what I'm showing you tonight only skims the surface of what we have in our collection, but I hope it will give you at least a sense of the archive, the school, and the people. So, let's rewind 133 years. In 1889, two sisters, Mrs. Carol Dunham and Mrs. George B. Cooksey, were looking for a bright young teacher who would be willing to start a new school in Irvington on the Hudson in order to educate their own children and the children of their friends. There were schools in the area, but none that the wealthy sisters felt satisfied with. While making inquiries, a young teacher, only 26 at the time, named May Friend Bennett, was recommended to the sisters by Ellen Hyde, who ran the Framingham Normal School, where Miss Bennett graduated. And so, Miss Bennett School was founded in 1890 with the funding and backing of a few influential families. The school's first location was the front parlor of Mrs. Cooksey's home. <laughs> the next year, the school moved to a designated building on Mrs. Dunham's property, and the year after, the building had to have a second story added. By 1893, the school had moved to two rented buildings in the town known as Breeze Lawn and had 18 boys and 30 girls enrolled, including five boarders, and it was known as Miss Bennett School for Girls and Boys. Her experience with boarders made Miss Bennett want to establish the school's reputation as a boarding school. This is also when the school became girls only, and she traveled up and down the Northeast talking to parents about her school and eventually boarding 12 girls. Miss Bennett's school kept outgrowing itself at a pace to keep Miss Bennett, her staff, and their funders scrambling. There are not many artifacts in the Bennett collection that date before 1900, although there are some photos and scrapbooks and photo albums, but to represent this decade, I chose an article from Godey's Magazine, published in 1893. Um, this is a reprint. I also have it up here. Um, and I think it was reprinted in the 70s, so it's, it's not an old artifact, but the, the text itself is old. So, let's see. All right. 
while Miss Bennett's school was making a name for itself, about 65 miles north, a hotel was under construction. Halcyon Hall was built from 1891 to 93. It was designed by the architect James E. Ware and funded by H.J. Davison, Jr., a publishing giant of the day based in New York City. It was built with the synthesis of the Shingle English Tudor Revival and Queen Anne architectural styles. The hotel opened in 1893. Simultaneous with the opening as a way of promoting the hotel, Godey's Magazine, also known as Godey's Ladies Book, ran an article extolling the virtue of the buildings, ground, and countryside of Millbrook. Godey's Magazine was a popular women's magazine based in Philadelphia. And here's a few choice quotes from the article. <clears throat> that Millbrook is an exceptionally lovely and beautiful spot. None will deny who has seen it. Here are roads as fine as those in Central Park and of endless number and variety. The article goes on to describe how the present inn at Millbrook is forced to refuse over 500 guests annually because of demand. The article is as glowing in its description of the hotel as it is of Millbrook's charm. It describes the many luxuries of Halcyon Hall, including ample piazzas, assembly rooms, library, parlor, music room, and art gallery, dining rooms, reception room, billiard room, and main hall, all with fireplaces for wood fires some of the rooms having two or more. There were also needle baths, a renovated farmhouse close by, tennis courts, and an 18-acre lawn for bicycling or horse riding. The article notes that there are, quote, a large number of the most improved bicycles available for rent. <laughs> As was common in Godey's Magazine, the article was illustrated throughout. So here we can see images of the main dining hall, here is the entrance court, which, by the way, there's um, a blown up and better quality image of this down in the Bennett room, framed, that you can go check out next time you're down there. And this is an image of one of the suites. It's simply labeled, One of Many. <laughs> Elsewhere in the article, it says Halcyon Hall could house 180 guests. And it was truly a luxury resort from the model of English gentry life. Halcyon Hall may have opened to great acclaim, at least in Godey's magazine, but it would struggle to be profitable and would close in 1901 or 1902 with less than a decade of operation. Reports differ on the exact date. Uh, we're going to leave Millbrook, though, and Halcyon Hall for a moment and return for now to Irvington on the Hudson as the new century dawns. As May Bennett began to focus more on boarding, she made the school exclusively for girls and moved it again from Breeze Lawn to Fair Lawn on Broadway Street close to the Denham's property. They annexed more land and developed the school until in this period it was five buildings and 90 students with lawns for archery and tennis and a particularly noted music program. But despite the school's success, Miss Bennett began to feel like Irvington on the Hudson was no longer the ideal location for the school. At this point, Halcyon Hall had already been closed for five or six years, but Miss Bennett had heard about the hotel and went to tour it with some of her friends and advisors. While still just scouting the location, Miss Bennett and her friends, the Slocums, had purposely not engaged any of the townspeople. But once she decided to buy the property, they approached Samuel Thorne, who encouraged the venture. Apparently, the Thorns and other families preferred Miss Bennett's proposal of her girls' school. Alternative proposals were an inebriate's home and a boys' school, both of which they, they felt were, were worse options than a girls' school. So. Uh, and this is a talk from Millbrook Historical Society, so I'm very pleased to finally reach the point where the main subject under discussion, Miss Bennett and her school, and the town of Millbrook converge. In November of 1908, the school and its new location was dedicated with pomp. There were marching and singing from students and speeches from Miss Bennett, Mr. Slocum, Bishop Greer, an Episcopal bishop, and James Monroe Taylor, the president of Vassar. One of the treasures of our archive is a number of photo albums and scrapbooks. So this is a scrapbook from Phyllis Blackstone, which dates from 1907 to 1908. You can see it's, it's really falling apart and the binding's totally, totally off, so I'm not going to hold it up for you. Um, but it has lots of images here. So, uh, Phyllis attended Bennett School from 1908 when it opened in Millbrook to 1912 when she graduated. The first half of the scrapbook is from the years before she attended, including some pictures of Thorndale, which she visited often, and some images of her dressed in various costumes. So here's Phyllis as Romeo. 
And then there are two pages, I'm really delighted by this, there are two pages of Mary and I as devils. So this is a little faded. This is, I think you can see a little better. I really, here wait, I have a, I have a laser pointer. I really love this image in the top left of them smiling as devils. Um, one thing I appreciate about the Phyllis Blackstone scrapbook is that she really gives a sense of not just her daily life, but a broader picture, including some really great architectural shots of the school. So here are three different views of Halcyon Hall from the time. Here's what appears to be an art studio on the upper floor. This is an image of Phyllis Blackstone in class. And you can see here an arrow actually drawn on the picture pointing to her to, to indicate that she's that one in the second row. Um, and then here's another architectural shot. And this image is pretty dark, but it is of horses and the stables. Writing was always a really core part of the curriculum at Bennett School. And Phyllis seems to have an especial love of horse horses. Um, she pictures numerous horses in, in, throughout the scrapbook. And here are some girls and faculty about to serve a meal. Here's one of my favorites. Here, the girls are partnered up with each other, about to learn some ballroom dancing. That first year, the school suffered considerable growing pains, including the heating not being adequate, a French teacher dying of pneumonia, and the school closing three weeks early due to an outbreak of scarlet fever. But despite a somewhat rough first year, the school in Millbrook grew and found needed financial stability as the first decade of the 20th century passed by. By 1910, the school was instituting new programs like an annual trip to Europe for the senior class, which began in 1910. The program would run for just four years before the trip to Europe would become untenable. I bet many in this audience can guess why. For those of you keeping track of dates, you'll notice we're hitting a really tumultuous decade. World War I begins overseas in 1914. So I've chosen uh, a Bible as the artifact for this decade of Millbrook's history, and I'm going to use it as an opportunity to talk about religious life at the school and for Miss Bennett herself, recognizing that religiosity would take on new meanings and resonances during the war years. Miss Bennett herself was a deeply religious woman. She wrote often of her faith in God in her many letters to correspondents. Bennett schoolgirls would attend chapel for instruction most mornings, as well as full Sunday services. This Bible, again, which is up here, you can kind of see the, the size of it, but here, I'll hold it. It's, it's pretty fragile, so I'm just going to be very careful. Here, here it is. And you can see it's quite a big Bible. Um, so. Uh, it's relatively simple, and it's a large copy meant for reading at chapel. It's unclear whether or not the same Bible would have been used by Miss Bennett for her Bible class. I think there's likely many Bibles that were being passed around, but of the Bible class, I found this great quote from a faculty member of the school who wrote, In warm weather, her Bible class would meet anywhere but under a roof, on the golf course, or in the lilac-sheltered lawn of the White House, or in the Greek theater where the pulsing life underfoot and in tree and shrub and overarching sky drove home to her hearers the sense of God in whom we live and move and have our being. Here are a few details from the Bible. Inside the front cover, it says the Bible was presented by William F. and Mary G. Slocum, November 20th, 1910. Um, the Slocums were close friends of Miss Bennett and big supporters of the school. On the back pages are two songs glued in, meant to be sung for opening and closing services. War broke out in Europe in 1914 and the United States joined the conflict in 1917, and during this time, chapel services were also used as a time to discuss the war and the role of citizens in the conflict. According to the biographer of Miss Bennett, many a morning chapel talk was given to vivid exposition of how the non-combative citizen could help the country by eliminating waste. Girls, faculty, and employees made bandages, even on Sundays, occasionally, a Sunday chapel was supplanted by a bandage making, being accompanied by the singing of hymns so familiar that hands did not need to pause to turn the pages of hymn books. During the war years, Bennett School planted corn, potatoes, carrots, onions, and other vegetables in fields on the school property. 
that the girls and faculty would work even during school hours. In 1917, Miss Bennett wrote in a letter that she was, quote, farming about 10 acres this summer. That land would eventually be reverted back to lawns for writing, and this Bible would come to be replaced with a fancier Bible, also held in our archive downstairs, as the decade again shifts. So before we delve right into the Roaring Twenties, I want to describe a meeting of like-minded individuals. In 1911, Miss Bennett first met Mr. Charles Rand Kennedy and his wife Edith Wynne Matheson, both respected actors of the day. Mr. Kennedy would also go on to be a notable playwright. The theatrical couple began to visit Miss Bennett, Bennett and the school frequently, performing for the students. Charles Kennedy was particularly known for his dramatic readings of the Bible. It wasn't until the summer of 1919, though, that the couple decided to take full responsibility of the school's drama department. Their first play produced at the school was Antigone, the Greek tragedy by Sophocles. The school first produced Antigone in 1920, but it would be produced again in 1923, and again in 1936. This artifact from the archive is a green binder with cast lists and production photos from all of those productions. Someone, I suspect Charles Kennedy or Edith Matheson, compiled numerous binders of production photos organized by play and then by year. So you can find other binders on plays like Orpheus, Electra, and Medea. But I, I chose to highlight Antigone, partly because it was the first of the annual Greek tragedy tradition, and because this binder really clearly highlights one major development in the theater program at the school during this time. So here, we are looking at a cast list for 1920. You can see it's not divided by role, but just by main characters, chorus leader, chorus members, and subs. Um, presumably the main roles would be assigned verbally to the students as they showed up for the first rehearsal. There, there are also two sets of names for each slot, one set in parentheses. I think this indicates that there was two casts, a main cast and an alternate cast for the production. Here are some staged production photos from the time, and I want you to note the space. Mm -hmm. It's interior on the proscenium stage and ballroom that Halcyon Hall was built with when it was still just a hotel. Mm -hmm. Now in 1922, the school built an outdoor Greek theater on campus, and a drama festival featuring a Greek tragedy gained a reputation as an annual event which would continue for decades. Sometimes the students would tour their productions elsewhere, to Vassar or Mount Holyoke. In the 1923 production of Antigone, we can see that they moved to the outdoor Greek theater. So here's the cast list again for the production. Again, the same format. And here are staged photos, this time in the new outdoor space. And I like this photo because you can also, and sorry for the glare, some of the photos I could like slide out of the binding and some I didn't want to because they, they were sort of fragile and attached. But, um, so I like this photo because you can actually see the, the seating up here on the right. And you can see two men actually sitting at the very top of the seating. Um, in 1923, they also took more close up production photos of the main cast. So here's an image labeled Creon, the uncle to Antigone and King of Thebes. And before you start thinking that that's a very good false beard for a girl's school, this is Charles Rand Kennedy himself, the director in the role. The back of the image confirms as much. And here we see, and ju just to be clear, it says Creon, Charles Rand Kennedy up there. Here we see a frustrated King Creon gesturing to two women who must be Antigone and Ismene. And finally, we have a close-up image of Antigone and Ismene. Now, if that Antigone looks a little old for a girl's school, um, that would make sense because I am 95% sure that this is Edith Matheson, Charles's wife. So the back of the photo doesn't describe who is in the picture. It just says Antigone's second production. Um, but here is an image comparison side by side of the production photo from Antigone and a publicity photo of a younger Edith. And I, I really think it's the same woman. And if so, how thrilling for the students of Bennett School. Because while Charles Rand Kennedy was a known actor and would become known as a playwright, Edith was something of a celebrity, appearing in The Merchant of Venice with Sir Henry Irving and starring in a production of Everyman as the titular role um, in a production that originated in England and toured the United States with the Greek company. She also appeared in two silent films shortly before this in 1915 and 1917. And I like to imagine Bennett girls giddy 
by the chance to work with her. I'm sure Charles and Edith's star power helped, but the town of Millbrook was supportive of the school's plays. In Carmine de, de Arpino's History of the Town, she writes, the most notable events were the Greek plays produced by the Kennedys in the open-air Greek theater at the Bennett School. They had an arrangement with the railroad that no whistle might be blown while the plays were in progress, which is a detail I just, I just love that they arranged that. So Miss Bennett herself seemed thrilled with the growth and the success of the theater department at the school. Sadly, the 1923 production of Antigone was probably the last show Miss Bennett would see performed by her students and her dear friends. She died in March 1924. She left Bennett School in the hands of Miss Courtney Carroll, who had been the assistant principal since 1920. Under Miss Carroll's direction, the school would also grow during this period to add two additional college years for interested students after the four-year high school curriculum as the school began to shift towards a college education. We're moving into the 1930s, and in 1935, Bennett School officially ends its four-year high school curriculum, moving exclusively to the two-year junior college model, and we are now officially Bennett Junior College. So I wanted to take a moment to show you some of the really remarkable artifacts that we have in our collection, um, namely articles of clothing. So this material is different from the largely semantic content of most of the archive, and I'm also breaking my rule a little bit about one artifact per decade because I'd like to show you a few articles of clothing we have. So, um, first up, we have these blue uniforms. <clears throat> um, just making sure that wasn't me. Okay, they are sleeveless, which makes me think they may have been for exercise or for early. Sorry, I heard it and I thought, is that coming from my pocket? It's not. Um, they are sleeveless, and that makes me think they may have been used for exercise or for early fall or late spring. At least during this time, students' names were carefully affixed to the tags of the clothing, which is how we know that both of these dresses were worn by Marjorie Organ, who graduated in 1932. Marjorie went on to marry and become Miss Marjorie Fitzgerald, and sh she lived here in Millbrook, so I don't know if anyone knows Marjorie Fitzgerald or knew her. Um, but she was active in the Alumni Association, which is likely why we have her donated uniform. And we also have a monographed handkerchief from her. Um, we also have an athletic jacket worn by Harriet Roeder. That's this guy. Um, <clears throat> Harriet graduated with a degree in dance in 1935, but it seems she was athletic in ways beyond dance as well. Her jacket has patches sewn in for tennis and basketball. There's also a T that you can see here, and it says, um, which, I, which I believe is for the mascot, which were tortoises, and then there's a patch that says GP over one of the pockets, and I haven't been able to work out what that means, so if anyone has any ideas, please let me know, because um, I'd, I'd love to know what that means. Um, and then finally, we have a pink cape. So this would have been worn for chapel services. Elsewhere in the archive, it talks about the students wearing white to chapel. So I'm guessing that this cape was used um, for students who were helping with the procession or with the altar. Um, it doesn't have a name affixed to it, probably because it would have been worn by different girls for different services. And without a name, it's a little harder to date, but I'm guessing that it because it comes with the other clothes that it was also being worn in the 30s, which means that it may have been worn for the opening and dedication of the Tudor-style chapel, which was built on campus in 1936. So one thing in common with all the articles of clothing, at least during this time, is their relative simplicity, especially for wealthy girls. This was by design. In one school catalog, it was advised the work done in gymnasium and in classes for training and speaking and singing brings about many changes in the physical proportions of the pupil. It is advisable, therefore, that girls bring only those clothes that are simply made and easily adjusted. And in the 30s in particular, uh, the simplicity of dress could also have been owed to the Great Depression. While Bennett School girls wouldn't have been as adversely affected as most of the country, again, coming from wealthy families, they would have been aware of those that were struggling. And as the country turned into a new decade and a new global conflict, disciplined austerity became a wartime virtue. While looking for something else entirely, I stumbled upon an unmarked binder 
where I discovered the records for the International Relations Club from 1937 to 1942. And for those of you who are bad at dates, and no shame if you are, World War II begins in 1939, with the United States entering the war in 1941 after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So it's fascinating to see students' responses to these international conflicts. So here's this unmarked binder that has the meeting minutes in it. The club seems to have typically consisted of a presentation on a geopolitical topic given by a member or a faculty member and some discussion. Early in the club's history, every third meeting was a movie program. They also discussed United States current events like the Supreme Court case and the General Motors strike that raised money through dues to provide, and they raised money through dues to provide daily newspapers <coughs> in common rooms of the school. This club was a part of a larger partnership with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and once a year the endowment would send one speaker to each club without charge. Some lectures were followed by tea. The binder is mostly full of minutes from official meetings submitted by the Secretary Treasury of the time. As World War II began, we see the club, which had been meeting once every two weeks since its inception, begin meeting weekly. In the notes for an October meeting in 1939, just two weeks after the war is declared in Europe, Secretary Treasurer Jane Colt wrote, We decided that there would be a compulsory meeting every two weeks and an optional meeting every once every week. The topic of this meeting is also mentioned in the same document. A short discussion was given on the origins of the Second World War by Dr. Moss. As we roll into 1940, the group is frequently discussing neutrality and isolation and debating the United States entering the war. In February 1941, not quite a year before the United States would enter the war, the faculty advisor for Bennett College, Thomas P. Whitney, organized a roundtable discussion with the Hotchkiss School, at the time a boys school. Here you can see the topic was, how can the nations of the Western Hemisphere best cooperate for defense and economic development? And I want to draw your attention in particular to point C, and this is blurry, it's not the photo quality, it's actually the, the, the document itself is pretty blurry, but point C says, how may totalitarian influence in the hemisphere be eradicated? And it was to be discussed by girls from Bennett College. So in November of that year, Bennett College and Hotchkiss School met again for a panel on the discussion question, what sort of peace should an allied victory produce? On December 7th, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. The International Relations Club met just three days later. I imagine the mood was somber. The notes say, Lewis and Sun gave speeches covering present-day Japan and her aggressiveness. When the club reconvened the following year, the topics were almost always of the war, sometimes looking at the past context that informed the current conflict, and sometimes reviewing very practical current affairs, such as the meeting in May of 1942, where Joan Robertson reported on present-day Italy, Phoebe Everett reported on the economic development of the Americas, and Lee Ross on the sugar rationing, Louis, Louis, Louis C. Swenson on the rubber rationing, and Helen White on gas rationing. Open discussion followed each talk. They also screened American propaganda films that were popular at the time, with titles like Women in Defense, Army in Overalls, Power for Defense, and What So Proudly We Hail. In the middle of all of this, I found myself intrigued and a little moved by a meeting the club held in April. The notes simply say, at this time, Miss Fair, with the help of Ellen Meads, performed a Japanese tea ceremony. The faculty was invited to attend. The club is grateful to Miss Fair for reenacting this colorful ceremony before us. This is now me fully extrapolating, but I like to imagine the students of Bennett College enacting a tea ceremony in the middle of a chaotic global conflict, not from Orientalist fascination, but as an opportunity to envision peace and global unity and to resist some of the easy villainizing that happens during wartime. This record of the International Relations Club ends in 1942, and our records for the club are a little spotty. It was certainly just one of many clubs at Bennett College, and in fact, rather appropriately, given that we are a library, the club we have the most records for downstairs is the Reading Club. <laughs> so we've lingered here a little while because I really love the granular minutiae of this moment and these records, but we're going to zip along 
World War II would end in 1945, and the school, still under the leadership of Miss Carroll, would continue to expand, adding 10 buildings, including new dormitories, that would help expand enrollment in the school. All right, so. The 1950s, the dawn of the Cold War, civil rights, and Elvis, and a decade of significant change for Bennett Junior College. In 1956, Miss Courtney Carroll stepped down as the president of Bennett Junior College and was replaced by Donald A. Elridge, who had been the dean of students at Wesleyan University prior to coming to Melbourne. The New York Times announced the change briefly here. Mr. Elridge will begin a tradition involving this bell, called the Mary Lyle Bennett Bell, or the Marie Bennett Bell, in different documentation. It was used to announce President's Day. According to notes in the archive, one student would be notified early in the morning and would go to the stables, get on a horse, and then ride through the courtyard of the school ringing the bell to signal a day off. Uh, truthfully, unlike other archival items I'm presenting today, I don't have a lot to unpack here with this bell. Like, there's not a ton to say. It's kind of just a bell. It doesn't even have an inscription. Um, I pulled it because I think it speaks to some of the more uncommon items we have in our archive that I think are quite exciting. And I thought, more than just show you, I thought I'd do a little demonstration. So I thought I'd give it a ring. Um, I want to warn you, it is a little loud. I, I don't think it's too loud, but it... it you can see how riding through the courtyard, all the students and all the dormitories would hear it. All right. So that's the Marie Lyle bell. And with the ringing of the bell and kind of zipping along here, history rushing by us, we're going to move on to the 60s. <laughs> so, yeah. as we move into the later years of Bennett College history, I'm profoundly aware that we are reaching years that some in the audience not only remember, but remember Bennett College during. So I'll move a little quicker here. Um, this is a presentation on a school, and as such I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't use a yearbook. Um, yearbooks, of course, are key archival evidence for schools of the style and lives of students. Our archive doesn't quite have a yearbook for every year, but it does have a good number of yearbooks, including yearbooks from 1904 and 1909. In the 60s now, we can see this yearbook from 1968, here on the screen, also in my hands, which has a very funny, idiosyncratic style I find almost unreadable. The cover says Bennett, and that's clear enough, but this is meant to say faculty, this is meant to say seniors. <laughs> the yearbook itself is fairly standard. Each senior gets their own photo, and it says what they are graduating with a degree in, sometimes a nickname. Shout out to the senior whose nickname was Onion in there. Um, and it usually has a quote from the seniors as well. Freshmen are shown in candid group shots. The last part of the yearbook is given to campus life photos, and it ends with sponsors, some of which are familiar to us. Bank of Millbrook, Joseph Villetri's Sons, Morona's Market, Reardon Briggs, the Millbrook Roundtable, as well as IBM, which took out a full page. There's a kind of baffling quarter page sponsorship placement that reads, <laughs> Men will pause for blood and gore. To our friends, best of luck in 68. Um, it's this one here. Here's Millbrook Roundtable, by the way. Um, I have to assume this is a joke, maybe an inside joke of some kind lost to the annals of history. But if anyone has any ideas, I'd be really curious to hear them. So I don't want to highlight any individual senior in particular because these are less historical figures at this point and more just people. But I'm going to show some of the images from the yearbook that I found evocative of the time. Here's a double page spread of the campus in winter. Here are girls surrounding a lamp post. Some girls in horseback. Again, horse. The horse um, riding curriculum was a really big part of Millbrook, and they did horse shows, which I wanted to show you too, but there's too much to cover, and I thought it was best to be specific about certain things. But horses, and then we have a couple kissing, and some girls blowing up balloons for a dance. <clears throat> the school was beginning to struggle in the late 1960s, but it really became apparent that the school was in trouble financially by the 70s. Bennett Archive has a lot of material about the school's bankruptcy, including trustee notes and recommendation, documentation about the attempt to merge with Briarcliff, which fell through, and a Millbrook Roundtable issue with the headline deals with the auction of Bennett College equipment and building. But I want to go back in 
this decade to look at a capital campaign launched in 1970 and use this for sure to talk about some of the reasons Millbrook uh, Bennett School closed. So they describe this campaign as the turning point campaign. And the front of the brochure is emblazoned with an old college, a new look, a turning point for times ahead. It also has an image of a building under construction which would become the Kettering Science Center. The campaign was meant to raise money both for the Science Center and for new dorms to expand enrollment. The dorms themselves had already been built and the campaign was raising money retroactively. The Science Center was also actively under construction by the time that the campaign was getting off the ground. And as the pamphlet states, the Science Center is also, the, and as the pamphlet states, quote, the Science Center is also a must if Bennett is to keep pace with the changing needs of education. On its completion in 1971, the Science Center will enable Bennett to meet its students' long-felt desire for truly adequate training in science. The design of the building, including its unique laboratory lecture hall, will permit new methods of teaching science. Hence, the center will serve as a prototype for the instruction of science in small colleges. Hindsight is 2020, but it's clear that the school never recovered financially from the addition of the dorms and the science center, leading eventually to bankruptcy. It's also true, though, that the junior college model was no longer as viable as it used to be. Additionally, many colleges were becoming co-ed during this time. Bennett College would attempt, attempt to integrate as co-ed in the mid-70s, but it was too late. And a few weeks after freshman orientation in the fall of 1977, Bennett College declared bankruptcy. Around 300 students who had already begun their semester were given the option of transferring to Marist, and the school officially shuttered in 1978. So we're ending our journey with the closure of Bennett College in 1978, but it should be noted that our archive does have a lot of material from, the school's closure, from after the school's closure, as the Passionate Alumni Association, the Friends of Halcyon Hall, and business people, local historians, and interested parties debated the future of the campus. Truly, there's a staggering amount of material to go through, and I hope I've been able to give a skimming overview of the school, delving deeply into a couple of key items but I also hope that the nature of this talk and, and the format of this talk reveals some of the gaps and the lacuna that I couldn't possibly cover and that I hope you will feel emboldened to fill in yourself. Which brings us to what we're doing with the archive now. So, the library staff started the process of digitizing the Bennett Archive last year. We want this material to be accessible online for those who live far away and for future generations. And I want to take a minute to show you how you can access the digital archive that we have up so far. So, I'll exit the PowerPoint. And I'll bring us over to the Millbrook Library website. So here we are on the Millbrook Library website. If you would like to access the Bennett College collection, as we have right now, you would go over here to Local History. And underneath this really great photo of Bennett School Girls fencing, you would <laughs> click visit the online Bennett collection. Now if you want to just browse what's in the collection, you could quite easily click explore the collection and see what we have available here. But if you're looking for something more specific than that, the search function here is really quite good. So I'm going to take you behind the curtain a little bit and use the example of the athletic jacket. And I knew when I was planning this lecture that I wanted to include the jacket as one of the artifacts. I think it's awesome. But I certainly don't know enough about fashion history to have been able to place the jacket in time. Um, I did, though, have the name of the woman who wore the jacket stitched onto the tag. So I could search for Harriet Roeder in the digital collection and see what come up. So as you can see, we have two hits. Clicking on the second one, and it immediately highlights Harriet's name. Um, and as I can, see, I can see now that she graduated in 1935, because this is the class of 1935 in an uh, alumni reunion photo. And this is an image of her. She's the one standing and on the right, and she's the one who would have worn this athletic jacket right now. <coughs> 
I know. She, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. So it's, it's really easy, and I hope it'll be a tool for people like you who are interested in local history. And that said, the process of digitization is slow going. Each page has to be individually scanned, and staff members are working on it in between the daily running of the library, which is why we're using this lecture as an opportunity to see if anyone would be interested in helping with the digitization <laughs> efforts. So the work itself is simple enough, and while it can move slowly, the work allows you time to read some of the material in the archive and get to know more of the history of the school and fall in love with the students, even specific students. I know someone, we already passed around an email sign-in list. This is a different email sign-in list. This is if you would like to potentially help digitize records here at the library. It's not you committing to do it, it's just you maybe being interested in being contacted to see if you might want to do it at a future date. So I'll start it here and it'll wind its way back. Well, what is the skill of, you know, what skill do you need to have? To this is a great question, Tony. What skill do you need to help digitize the archives? You need to be able to take a book, to put the book onto a scanner. It's even a scanner that's like at a desk where you are sitting. You put it on the scanner, you click a few buttons on the computer, it scans the page, you flip the page in the book, you scan the next page. It's so simple, and we would be able to walk you through it. You would be doing it during library hours, where if there's ever an issue, you could just walk over and ask about it. It really doesn't require tech capabilities, um, and I hope that if you're at all interested in the school, that you sign up, because we'd really love, love help getting it done. So additionally, I want to say, if you're not as interested in um, helping with digitization, but you do want to look through the physical archive. You can also now go down here and click Request Access. It pulls up this form, and you would just either print and hand this form to us or email this form to us, and we can get you set up so that you can actually go down and look at the archive yourself. I promise it's, it's really a lot of fun. There's a ton of stuff down there, um, which brings me to my conclusion. So, so I fast forwarded past the legal and business proceedings of the year after Bennett's closure. I fast forwarded past the alternative history after it fell into ruin where it became a destination site for urban explorers with cameras and teens with spray bottles. Fast forwarding <laughs> to arrive at some very recent history. September 2021, just over a year ago now, Aww. demolition began on Bennett College campus. We watched as piece by piece the campus was taken apart and taken down, starting with a asbestos abatement and ending with the chimneys of Halcyon Hall, the last vertical architectural elements to finally be leveled. I don't think I'm alone in feeling a loss as the buildings and especially Halcyon Hall came down. Don't get me wrong, I know it needed to happen. And I'm grateful for the work of Millbrook Community Partnership led by Oakley Thorne, both at the Bennett College site and with the Thorne Building. I'm excited about the 32-acre community park that will replace the decaying old building that was. And I look forward to strolling through the lush grass and picnicking in the shade of some maple tree. That said, like many, I found the old building strikingly beautiful, even as the roof sagged and kudzu climbed up the facade. Beyond the grim aesthetics of ruins, the visibility of the campus, positioned where it was as a, at a busy intersection, served as a constant reminder of the history of Bennett College and the many students who passed through. The building allowed everyone to see history imprinted in the present, to ask and to learn about it. With the building gone, we must be more intentional about preserving and sharing the history of Bennett College. While Halcyon Hall stood as an aging monument to the to part of Millbrook's past, another kind of monument built of paper and stacks of boxes lies quite literally beneath our feet. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that's my presentation. Like I said, I just read directly through. But was there any comments, any questions that came up? Um, I see. The sheet's still making its way around, so if you have more questions about that process and whether or not you feel like you can sign up, I'm happy to answer those too. I'm curious, what kind of degrees do the girls get? 
Oh, there were a lot of different programs. So there was degrees in dance, there was um, a really prominent program in child studies. There was a nursery, which I understand, is John Flanagan here? He's not. Oh, so John Flanagan, who's a um, member of the History Society, went to the nursery school. So there was a teaching nursery there. Um, there were degrees in English. In the yearbook, you can flip through and actually see. It was pretty standard things. Um, yeah, I think that was part of the child care program, right? Yeah, the teaching nursery. Went to the mm -hmm. nursery school. Rosemary, I can't think of, does anybody know her last name? She was the head of the... Of the nursery school. Oh, yes, and she was such a wonderful person. Yeah, so we have great staff. And the girls were great. And in the archive, there's um, documentation from the nursery school, including names and carefully listed heights and weights for all the children that passed through. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. Was, it, was there any alteration uh, of Halcyon Hall during <coughs> after the uh, process of becoming a, the college? Or yes. There was significant alteration, and I didn't get into it, but a really good source, if you are really fascinated by that architectural history, is that the Friends of Halcyon Hall in the uh, seven, no, no, 91, I believe, actually, submitted Halcyon Hall for inclusion on the historic uh, register, the Register of Historic Places. And in that, they do a really detailed documentation of the building and the alterations that were made. Um, so there's a, a huge amount of architectural history that went into that report, and it is in, in the archive, and you could really look through it and get a lot of detail. So, yes, is the short answer. An interesting um, piece of fact, they, they had the auction you were mentioning. Yeah. And um, we, because we look like diagonal from here. Well, not from here, but from <laughs> college. <laughs> um, we grew up, and um, we went through that auction a little bit, and my mom, my dad bought one of the big, huge tables that oh, we cool. have as a dining room table. Mm -hmm. And um, it pulls out the leaves, you know, from the top, it pulls it from underneath. Oh, and cool. that was um, one of the uh, tables that they had in like a conference room and stuff. Yeah. I, so she still has that in her dining room. That's amazing. They auctioned all sorts of stuff off. There was like pianos. There was the writing center got auctioned off for $280,000 or something. Um, so buildings got even auctioned off during that time. And um, again, there's documentation about about that auction in the archive, which is really cool. I remember the, the cherry walnut type of uh, staircases, and it's like dark. Yeah. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing. That's amazing. Robert? Great. Well, I'll just say thank you so much for that talk. I think that I'm not the only one who probably had this reaction, but so much work and so much thought probably went into what you heard uh, over the last hour or so. And so, Kristen, thank you for doing all that work and for presenting to us. It was great.